There are some ancient places that have just been discovered. Thanks to drought, at least 80 ancient places have been revealed, including some cities that we all thought were just a myth. We may have found the location of King Arthur's Camelot, another Valley of the Kings somewhere you would never expect, and maybe even signs of the apocalypse. Let's jump right in. Secrets of the Euphrates The Euphrates River was once the most important waterway in the world. This great river was responsible for the birth of many early human civilizations. Mesopotamia grew up around the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Now that both of them are starting to go dry, archaeologists are finding places that have been hidden by water for centuries. This could be the end of the world as we know it. In western Iraq, the disturbingly low water in the Euphrates has led to the discovery of at least 80 ancient areas over the past few years. One of the most amazing places revealed was a lost city from 3,400 years ago. Nobody had known it was there until suddenly the water dropped and the ruins were shining in the ferocious sun. It's believed the city was called Zakiku, part of the Bronze Age Mitanni Empire in 1550 BC. But there are other secrets in the river being revealed as well, some of them more daunting than others. According to the Bible, there will be some very obvious signs before the end of the world comes. By the end of the world, I mean the apocalypse. One of those signs is that the Euphrates River will run dry, releasing the fallen angels chained somewhere at the bottom. This will begin what is known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation. The seven seals will be broken and the planet will fall into chaos. While the prison of the angels hasn't been found yet, it could happen soon. Mysterious caves have already been found within the river, previously covered by water. Some have noted how the strange caves look weirdly like prisons. Angelic prisons, maybe? There is a strong belief in many religious communities that any day now, the Euphrates will go dry and the fallen angels will be released. Camulodunum Camulodunum is the name of the legendary first capital of the Roman province of Britannia. Many people have never heard of this ancient place, yet it was the most important city in the modern history of England as a country. Before the Roman invasion of the British Isles in the year 43 AD, the area of present-day Colchester was occupied by Iron Age tribespeople. The Trinovantes had built a stronghold dedicated to a god named Camulus, whom modern historians know very little about. The gods of the ancient tribes of Britain were numerous and powerful. When the Romans arrived, they associated Camulus with their own deity, Mars. The first big target for the Romans was the stronghold of Camulus. If they were going to capture the British Isles, the Romans needed to first defeat the largest fortress near the shore. This would give them control of the region. If they hadn't gotten that first foothold, the Roman invasion may have gone very differently. After some fighting, the Romans took over the tribal land and inhabited the old fortress. They built their own legionary stronghold at Camulodunum, and thus it became the first Roman city in Britain. Up until that point, Britain was populated mostly by primitive villages, but by the year 49, Camulodunum had become a sophisticated civilian town. As the Romans spread across the region, Camulodunum established itself as a true city. It had proper roads, drainage, gateways, temples, and waterworks. It was everything you would expect from the Romans. They also built the city of Londinium during this time, which would later become the city of London. The good times didn't last for long, though. The fearsome Queen Bodica of the Iceni tribe led a devastating rebellion. The three major Roman towns were all destroyed by a coalition of tribes resisting Roman rule. Everyone inside Camulodunum was slaughtered mercilessly. In the wake of the destruction, Camulodunum was rebuilt even bigger. But when the Roman Empire collapsed in the 4th century, so did Camulodunum. It remained occupied for another 100 years or so, but was gradually abandoned. Now, there is nothing of it left but a few ruins in the modern city of Colchester. And now for a quick break because it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Downey416 Toronto and David Foster and his sons for supporting this channel. Hi guys! Thanks for watching! We wouldn't be here without you! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about incredible ancient places! 
the empty zone. In the Mexican state of Campeche, there is a place known to archaeologists as the empty zone. They call it that because up until very recently, researchers didn't think there was anything to discover in the region. Everyone thought it was an empty patch of jungle without so much as a temple worth investigating. Now, with the discovery of pyramids, palaces, and even a ball court, Mexico's empty zone isn't so empty after all. Researchers with Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History hacked through the jungle using machetes. They eventually reached a city that has been standing for almost 2,000 years. The whole area is virtually untouched by archaeologists. The ruins are so exceptional, it's astounding that nobody's ever heard of them before. Mexican scientists are calling the lost city Ocontún, which is the Maya word for the stone columns that were found in the ruins. It was likely a major city for Maya life starting as early as 250 AD. That was when the Roman Empire was in full swing in Europe. Then, after almost 700 years, this great city was abandoned in 900 AD. It was deserted for unknown reasons. You might be wondering how archaeologists even stumbled upon such a city. It was thanks to over a decade of light detection and ranging technology, also known as LIDAR. In simple terms, LIDAR is laser scanning the forest floor in search of lost ruins. It was laser technology that brought archaeologists here, and now they have their work cut out for them. They've already identified palaces and pyramids, but the truth of the city's history remains an enigma. It will take years for archaeologists to learn what happened in Okomtun, the Hanging Gardens. Out of all the seven wonders of the ancient world, there is one that might not have even existed. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon are a mystery that goes back 2,500 years. Nobody, not even the greatest historians alive, can solve it. According to archaeologists, there is not a single ancient site in the city of Babylon to support the existence of an immense garden. But it must have existed if it was on the list of seven wonders, right? The Pyramid of Giza is the only thing on the ancient list still standing. The other six wonders have been gone or destroyed beyond recognition for centuries. Even so, there is enough evidence to know they were real. The ruins of the Temple of Artemis can be visited in Turkey. The Lighthouse of Alexandria was built over by a citadel still in the city of Alexandria. The mausoleum at Halicarnassus survived for 1,000 years in pieces after the list of seven wonders started to circulate. There is proof for all of them, except the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Legend has it the gardens were built by Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II with help from Queen Amitis. It was the queen who wanted the gardens built to have some greenery in the otherwise arid landscape of Babylon. The oldest mention of the gardens comes from 2,300 years ago in the writing of a Babylonian priest named Berossus. Plenty of others wrote of the gardens, enough to make them feel real. All the ancient people who witnessed the gardens claimed Nebuchadnezzar had established a paradise within his city. The wonder was a terraced garden in the shape of a pyramid with large trees and beautiful flowers. There were pillars filled with soil and plants growing in all directions. It was at least a stadium in height, with the plants fed by water from the Euphrates. It was, in essence, the first ever botanical garden. But let's get back to if this place really existed or not. What are your thoughts? If you want to go the practical way, you'll say that no proof means it didn't happen. But according to Stephanie Daly from the University of Oxford, that's nothing but a cop-out. Stephanie, an expert on ancient Assyria, believes the Hanging Gardens did exist, but she thinks they were in the city of Nineveh, which is sadly destroyed. Ancient Phoenicia Ancient history tells us that the Phoenicians were the only true rivals of the Greeks. The two civilizations competed to dominate trade in the Mediterranean Sea. But was there even a place called Phoenicia? Some modern scholars believe there was never any real location called Phoenicia. That was because Phoenicia, much like Greece in its early days, was not a unified country. There wasn't a single king, but rather city-states spread across the Levant ruled by their own kings and queens. The Levant includes modern regions of Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon. Their borders stopped at ancient Syria. Some of their most important cities were Arwad, Byblos, Tyre, Sidon, and Carthage. But because they were a seafaring nation, it's believed the Phoenicians also established colonies everywhere their ships would reach. They got at least as far as Spain, just like the Greeks did. 
There was one glaring difference, though, between the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Greeks had an indisputable sense of self. All the ancient Greek documents prove that Greeks, whether they were Macedonian, Athenian, or Spartan, recognized themselves as being Greek. It was the same as a Californian, recognizing they are also an American. But in Phoenicia, there is no evidence of that. Researchers don't even know if they call themselves Phoenicians. There's never been a term found that was used by the people of the ancient Levant to call themselves a specific name. They just refer to themselves by the name of whatever city they belong to. People in Sidon called themselves Sidonians, and so forth. Now, it's time to get biblical. The people of Phoenicia were almost definitely originally called Canaanites. In the Bible, Canaanites are the people who lived in the Levant, which the Bible called Canaan. Phoenicia is probably the Greek term for Canaan. As you can tell, this is a hugely complicated subject. That said, the evidence is there to support that the Phoenicians and the Canaanites were the same people from a real place called Canaan. The Bible was telling the truth. Camelot A retired professor from England believes he has discovered the exact location of Camelot. Peter Field, an expert in all things Arthurian, says he knows where King Arthur's castle stood 1,400 years ago. You're not going to believe it because you've already heard the name of this place just a few minutes ago. Peter claims that Camelot once stood on the ruins of an ancient Roman fortress town called Camulodunum. The very first capital of the Roman province of Britannia may have also been where King Arthur had his castle constructed decades after the Roman Empire was destroyed. In 500 AD, Celtic-speaking Britons defended the country against the Anglo-Saxon invaders flooding into what is now the United Kingdom. Peter says that if the Britons wanted to defend against these invaders, the right place to do it would be in the same place the Romans first conquered 2,000 years ago. It seems all ancient people recognize the importance of the area near modern Colchester. But could Arthur have really existed? And did he build his castle on Camulodunum's ruins? If the legends are to be believed, King Arthur was one of the defenders fighting the Anglo-Saxons, with his great castle of Camelot acting as his home base. Peter Field believes that over the years, the name Camulodunum was shortened to Camelot. And yeah, that does make sense if you think about it. However, it is important to know that no ruins of Arthur's castle have technically been found. Historians say there is no proof Camelot existed, or that Arthur was even a real king. What do you think? Let me know in the comments! The Altar of Sacrifice One of the weirdest monuments in Rome is a blood altar that not many people have heard of before. It's called the Altar of Augustan Peace, fully restored and reassembled inside a modern pavilion. It's an open tourist attraction, though it's far from famous. It's certainly not as popular as the Colosseum. The history of this unusual monument goes back to roughly 9 BC. The monument was erected in the Campus Martius. This was a section of Rome situated between the rolling hills outside the city and the Tiber River. The monument was made at the behest of Emperor Augustus upon his return from Spain and Gaul. Emperor Augustus had many great victories during his campaigns there, so he wanted a great altar built in his name. What was the point of the altar, though? Like I said earlier, it was for blood. The Romans may have been sophisticated and technologically savvy, but they were still humans. Ritual slaughtering of animals was commonplace throughout Rome. It was routine in their religion. In most cases, it was done outside. The altar of the Augustan peace was almost definitely used in such barbaric rituals. Bali's Valley of the Kings Bali is by far one of the most amazing tourist destinations in Asia. But did you know it has its very own Valley of the Kings? A massive funerary complex just like the Valley of the Kings in Egypt? In the 11th century AD, 1,000 years ago, the native people living in Bali began construction on a pair of courtyards. They carved two massive courtyards into the solid rock wall of a towering cliff. Inside each courtyard, they then cut enormous shrines to look like the facades of temples. It was a seriously complicated construction project. The builders had to dig 40 feet into the ground, clearing out countless tons of rocks to form the courtyards. Then they diligently created the shrines inside. All these years later, historians still don't know the entire point of the courtyards. 
It's believed the funerary complex was built to celebrate the first kings of the Udayana dynasty, who ruled Bali and Java. It's a logical theory, but one that hasn't been fully confirmed. The eastern courtyard was presumably dedicated to King Udayana, the first of his name, and his wife, Queen Mahendra Datta, but also his sons. Anak Wungsu, Marakata, and Erlanga. The western courtyard was dedicated to King Udayana's concubines. Maybe his son's concubines, too. It's unclear. If the archaeologists are correct, Bali's Valley of the Kings was made to celebrate the family of a greedy king and his dozens of treasured concubines. In later years, the courtyards became important religious spaces. As Hinduism and Buddhism reached Bali from India, the ancient place became more important for prayers and tranquility. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Secret Lost City Many significant discoveries have just been made thanks to new technology. Using LiDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, and 4K cameras mounted on drones, Archaeologists have uncovered some secrets of a lost city in Israel with a history that goes back at least 2,600 years. For centuries, this city was buried beneath the sand, and it's only just starting to emerge from the layers of sediment. Located south of Jerusalem, the village is called Beit Lehi Beit Loya, and it's taking a whole lot of cutting-edge technology and physical excavations to get to the bottom of this historic mystery. From what archaeologists can tell so far, the village was first settled by Jewish people sometime around the late 6th century BC, then later abandoned, rebuilt, abandoned, and rebuilt. Over the years, it was taken over by pagans, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But by the 14th century AD, the city had just kind of fallen off the map. The remains were first rediscovered in 1899, but then ignored until the 1980s when a team of researchers from Hebrew University were funded by donors in Utah of all places. They then went on to discover the remains of a Byzantine church with mosaic floors in almost perfect condition. Now, researchers have uncovered only about 20% of the extremely large village, a village they say may actually be the biblical site in which the legendary Samson killed a thousand Philistines using nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. Kalatka Darband Way back somewhere around 331 BC, Alexander the Great took over a place called Kalatka Darband on his way to conquer Persia. While on the hunt for Darius III, the bustling city had the misfortune to be in his way, and a bit after Alexander passed through, the city vanished from all historical records. There's been no trace of it for about 2,000 years. But just recently, archaeologists have announced to the world that they believe they have finally uncovered this mysterious ancient city. As Live Science reports, in the 1960s, spy satellite imagery revealed an ancient site near the Zagros Mountains in Iraq, but the information was classified. When it was finally made public, archaeologists from the British Museum couldn't wait to get their hands on it, and were finally able to send drones over the area. Located in the Kurdish region of Iraq, lead investigator John McGuinness told the Times that because of the turbulence in the region, archaeologists weren't able to begin excavating until 2016, and then that was interrupted again by the coronavirus situation. But just why is this city so important? When archaeologists were able to finally get their hands dirty, they found a treasure trove of ancient artifacts. The site contains a large fort as well as several large structures to press grapes and make wine. There were many buildings with Greco-Roman architecture and statues and ceramics found all over the site, representing Greek gods. Nearby, there is evidence of an even older settlement that dates back to the Assyrians during the 8th century BC. This lost city is a wonderful representation of what it would have been like during the time of Alexander the Great. But what archaeologists really want to know is why this city disappeared from all records, whether it was abandoned slowly after Alexander's conquest or if the great conqueror destroyed the entire place on his way through. City of Troy The legendary city of Troy has been around for a very long time, and for thousands of years, people thought it was just a myth. The city was immortalized in Homer's great epic, The Iliad, but it was also a very real place located on the Turkish coast. Legend says that Troy was the site of a war that raged for 10 years between the Trojans and the Greeks. While we don't know how much of the story is real, or even if the characters in the story existed, archaeologists have rediscovered the incredible city. Believe it or not, it still stands, just under a different name. Today, Troy, or rather its ruins, 
can be found at the site of Hisarlik. Its history goes back 4,000 years, though it was 2,700 years ago when the Greeks were colonizing a lot of the Turkish west coast. In the 19th century, the scholar and archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann did excavations in Hisarlik and discovered treasures that he believed came from King Priam of Troy, detailed by Homer in his epic story. What's really amazing is that at least 10 cities have stood where Troy once was. Whenever one city was destroyed, another was built in its place. This has left nearly a dozen layers of ruined cities for archaeologists to dig through. It probably started as a settlement and then grew larger and larger, before finally reaching its prime after 2550 BC. This was when the huge wall around the city was built, and it stood high and proud until the Greeks came up with their famous treacherous horse. Kalibangan Deep in the middle of the desert in Rajasthan, India, archaeologists have found evidence that ancient settlers once thrived in this barren land. People lived here for roughly 4,700 years. Archaeologists found evidence of some of the earliest plowed agricultural fields anywhere in the country. The Gagar River that once made the lands fertile has now dried up, but it was once a source of life for these mysterious desert people. The lost city that has been rediscovered here is called Kalibangan, and it was inhabited probably during two different periods, the pre-Harappan and the Harappan. The first group worked the field back around the year 2700 BC. The site was rediscovered in modern times by the Italian researcher Luigi Pio Tessitori in 1917, but it wasn't identified as a Harappan site for another 30 years. Then from between 1961 to 69, the Archaeological Survey of India excavated the place and realized they had stumbled upon a provincial capital of one of the greatest civilizations that ever lived, the Indus Valley Civilization. In the year 2700 BC, scholars believe the people living here experienced a massive earthquake that caused the residents of the ancient city to flee. The site remained abandoned until much later. When the people finally came back, they turned Kalibangan into a fortified city with spacious courtyards, drainage systems, and mysterious altars spread across town that were probably used for ritualistic purposes. Archaeologists just can't say yet what kind of rituals these mysterious people participated in. Lost Egyptian City The discovery of a lost city in Egypt is so impressive that it's been labeled the most extraordinary find since the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun. Since the discovery is so new, it will take years to fully understand the enormity of this discovery. The city is called Aten, and its history goes back 3,000 years. The city was established during Egypt's 18th dynasty by the powerful ruler King Amenhotep III. At the time, Aten was probably the largest industrial settlement anywhere in the world, located by what is today the ancient city of Luxor. This was a time when the Egyptian empire was at its wealthiest. What's really amazing is that the city was discovered by accident. Archaeologists had been searching for the mortuary temple of King Tut when they found this place. The team then found foundations made of mud bricks and realized they were toiling in the middle of a massive city with its walls and buildings still preserved beneath the dirt. After digging, they found many of the buildings here to be nearly complete, with tall walls, rooms filled with ordinary tools used by people in their daily lives, and even mysterious artifacts. They found rings, scarabs, hieroglyphic inscriptions on many surfaces, a bakery, a kitchen with ovens and pieces of pottery for storing food, and so much more. But what exactly happened to the people who lived here? Archaeologists don't know just yet. Although they've been able to date the city based on artifacts they found, they still don't know how it managed to be buried and lost for thousands of years. Calakmul Calakmul is located in the Mexican state of Campeche, about 22 miles from the border with Guatemala. Today, Calakmul is home to monkeys and around 230 species of birds, and it's overgrown by the hungry jungle. The ruins here are remote and beautiful, and according to archaeologists, they represent a unique settlement that was lost to history for hundreds of years. In ancient Maya, Calakmul translates roughly to the city of the two adjacent pyramids. The city probably stood for at least 1,200 years, from between 550 BC and 900 AD. It was in the center of the Mayan region, meaning the people who lived here would have been influenced by the cities to the north and to the south. They probably operated as part of a coalition of other Maya settlements like El Mirador and Nakbe. 
Between 500 and 800 AD, this city had about 50,000 inhabitants and over 6,700 structures, covering an area of 27 square miles. Archaeologists say only a portion of the city was actually open to the public, as much of it was reserved for the governing body of the region, such as the rulers and the high priests. Still, this ancient city held sway over roughly 1.5 million people living along its outskirts. So why was it abandoned? Like much of the Maya kingdom, Kalakmul just kind of fell into disrepair. The people left, and it was abandoned, not discovered again until modern times. The Sunken City of Poseidon The lost city of Helike has been described as the real-life Atlantis of ancient Greece. It was destroyed by an earthquake in the year 373 BC. After the earthquake, a tsunami pulled the ancient city into the water and submerged it completely in the Gulf of Corinth erasing this powerful port city from the earth. It's believed that the city was founded in the Bronze Age and was the leader of something called the Achaean League, a kind of band of port cities ranging all the way to Asia Minor. The destruction of Helike was so dramatic and well known at the time that it was written down by plenty of Roman and Greek authors, so historians have a pretty solid understanding of what happened. It's believed that Plato was actually inspired by the sinking of Helike when he came up with the myth of Atlantis. This might actually have been the Atlantis that Plato was talking about. Even after its destruction, Helike remained a point of interest for hundreds of years. Greeks who visited the site 150 years after the disaster claimed that the massive bronze statue of Poseidon could still be seen mostly submerged and that his trident was causing a problem for fishermen and their nets. All mention of the city ceased at around 174 AD, when the last traces of it were submerged. It wasn't until 1861 that a German archaeologist discovered a bronze coin with the head of Poseidon on it, likely from Helike. But it still wasn't until the 1960s that archaeologists were able to actually dive off the coast of Greece and rediscover this fascinating lost place. Scarabray Scarabray is a prehistoric village in Scotland that was rediscovered thousands of years after it was lost, thanks to a horrible winter storm that battered Orkney back in 1850. The storm, a mix of strong winds and high tides, ripped the grass off of a large mound and revealed the buried Neolithic village beneath. To this day, Scarabray is widely considered the most precious prehistoric monument anywhere in Europe. It consists of several stone buildings, like ancient houses that had been built into the grassy hill like hobbit holes. Radiocarbon dating in the 1970s, over 100 years after the first traces of the village were found, finally revealed just how old this place really is. It was probably inhabited for around 600 years, between 3200 and 2200 BC. There are a total of eight dwellings linked together by covered passages, and amazingly, they all look as though they were abandoned just yesterday because of how well-preserved they were kept by being covered in sand and grass. Scarabray was abandoned 4,000 years ago, probably because of the encroaching sand dunes. The people living here realized that the sand was soon going to cover up their houses, so they went and built houses somewhere else. And then that's exactly what the sand did, covering their dwellings until the Great Storm of 1850. Akrotiri the prehistoric settlement of Akrotiri is on the Greek island of Santorini. It was once one of the most important places anywhere in the Aegean Sea. In prehistory, it was a Minoan port town that had connections not only to mainland Greece, but also to places like Egypt and Syria. Today, the town is completely covered in ash because of a volcanic eruption. The city itself dates back at least 6,000 years. It became a main urban center about 2,000 years after. It was one of the most sophisticated places anywhere in the region, with exquisite paintings, an elaborate drainage system, and most of the houses were furnished in high-quality decorations and furniture. Archaeologists have even found imported objects from places like Cyprus and Egypt. Basically, these guys were rich. But what about that volcanic eruption? It happened in the 17th century BC, when a series of major earthquakes forced the inhabitants to evacuate. Shortly after the earthquakes, a volcanic eruption blanketed the town in ash, preserving it forever and earning it the nickname Greek Pompeii. The people here had managed to evacuate, unlike the poor souls who were vaporized at Pompeii. The city was then lost under the ash until modern days when archaeologists rediscovered it. Konye Urgench Konye Urgench, also known as Old Gurganj, is a modern city in Turkmenistan with about 30,000 people but the modern town overlaps the ruins of the more ancient settlement beneath. 
Under the relatively modern structures of this forgotten place, the ruins of the old capital of Khwarezm, once part of the mighty Achaemenid Empire, lie largely unexplored. Nobody knows exactly when the town was founded. Archaeological evidence suggests the first structures were built somewhere around the 5th century BC. We know the area was conquered by the Arabs in 712 AD and that Old Gurganj rose to prominence for 400 years, starting in the 10th century. Genghis Khan burned it to the ground in 1221 and it was later rebuilt, described in the 14th century by a mystic traveler named Ibn Battuta as the most beautiful and important city of the Turks. The area experienced a bit more blood and war, especially in 1373 when it was attacked by Timur and forced to surrender. The Turkmen people then inhabited this ancient place until the 1700s, when it was completely abandoned and left undisturbed and unseen by human eyes for another 300 years. That is, until 2005, when archaeologists began excavating and learning more about this old city. Now Bawaka. Nestled nearly 3,000 feet above sea level in Peru's sacred valley are the ruins of an ancient monument called the Nyaubawaka. It was built with such precision, no one can explain how the job was done without modern technology. Its purpose is also a mystery. For some, it is an ancient portal to another world, or proof that the ancient people here had some sort of relationship with the ancient Egyptians. The site is marked by a V-shaped entrance leading into a cavern that houses a ceremonial altar with three niches, or false doors, that are big enough to accommodate one person each. Even now, it would be difficult to create something with such straight lines, smooth surfaces, and perfectly carved shapes. But it's beyond our comprehension that ancient people built the site without the laser-like tools that exist today. How did they do it? It's also difficult to imagine how the builders chose the perfect place for the monument, which was carved from a magnetic blue stone that stands out against the surrounding sandstone. Blue stones were highly valued by prehistoric people from all over the world, including those who built Stonehenge, but nobody knows exactly why. The use of three doors was also common among many ancient cultures around the world, including Persia and Egypt. These doors in the ancient world were known as spirit doors, or windows into paradise. The false door of Naupawaka is said to mark the passage of the Earth's electromagnetic currents. Apparently, if you stand there long enough, you start to feel strange energy which would make you feel closer to the gods. The impressive accuracy of Naupawaka leaves one to wonder if its builders inherited knowledge from an advanced previous mother culture whose existence is all but lost to history. And the common features it shares with other ancient monuments begs the question of whether different civilizations who were not known to have contact with one another shared common roots. Ringing Rocks Park Bucks County, Pennsylvania is home to a 7-acre field filled with a 10-foot layer of boulders that emit bell-like tones when tapped. The peculiar site is surrounded by a forest, and only an estimated one-third of the rocks make noises that humans can hear. But a 1965 study proved that they all vibrate and ring, often at lower tones than we are capable of detecting without technology. The boulders are made up of standard materials, mainly iron and other hard minerals. Scientists haven't quite figured out what gives them their musical quality. Some people believe that they have supernatural qualities, but geologists suspect that the sounds are caused by stresses in the rocks. Experts also believe that the freeze-thaw cycle that created the field of boulders may have something to do with how and why they make noise. Regardless of the mechanisms behind these natural chimes, local musicians enjoy jamming out on them. The first concert at the site took place in 1865. It's illegal to take any souvenirs from the site, and there is no point in doing so anyway. Once a rock is separated from the others, it loses its ability to produce sound. The website reminds visitors to bring their own hammer to tap the stones and hear the sound. Silbury Hill Located in Wiltshire, England, Silbury Hill is a 4,700-year-old Neolithic mound that continues to baffle experts even after centuries of careful study. Measuring 130 feet high, it's the largest man-made prehistoric mound in Europe. It has attracted archaeologists, historians, tourists, photographers, and all kinds of people trying to uncover the mystery of this place. What was it for? The first of three construction phases began around 2660 BC, and it was no small undertaking. An estimated 18 million man-hours went into building Silbury Hill, 
To give you an idea, that's the equivalent of 700 people working for 10 years each. Researchers know relatively little about the site's history because it's proven difficult to go inside the mound to learn more about it. A shaft was dug into the hill in 1776 and was capped, but the cap collapsed in 2000 and water damage has widened the hole, which threatens to destroy the mound entirely. It is clear that the site was used for a long time, including by the Romans and the Saxons as a military lookout. During the 11th and 12th centuries, it was used as a fortification. Everybody loved this place, but the contents of the mound and much of its history remain a mystery. A 17th century legend holds that Silbury Hill is the final resting place of a leader named King Sil, who was buried on horseback. During the 18th century, the story evolved to claim that the king and his horse were made into life-sized figures of solid gold. Rumors about why the mound was built and for what reason have ranged from the English equivalent of a pyramid to something built by evil forces. Still, the true reasons remain a mystery, and we're left to wonder. Sedona Vortexes Sedona, Arizona is famous for its breathtaking scenery. It's also known for its vortexes. A vortex is a natural place filled with intense energy that some believe comes directly from the planet's core, known as feminine energy, or travels directly to the core, known as masculine energy. There are four vortexes in Sedona, where even the trees grow toward the highest concentration of energy, almost as if they are being pulled toward the center of a tornado. Besides the strangely twisting trees, there are usually no visible signs of the vortexes, although some people have claimed to see colored orbs near the energy centers. Typically, however, the energy is something that is felt. The atmosphere is supposedly mildly magnetic, and visitors have reported feeling tingling on their skin and low vibrations coming from within the Earth. For a long time now, people have traveled to the vortexes for mystical healings. Reaching them requires a hike and can be challenging, especially during the hot summer months. The Boynton Canyon Vortex is the most sacred of these sites. It contains a balance of masculine and feminine energy and functions as a spiritual center for the native Yavapai Apache people. Not everyone believes that the so-called energy of the vortexes is real, but pretty much anyone can agree that these places are extremely peaceful and that they are perfect for meditating and getting in touch with your inner self. Tinos Island Tinos is a tiny Greek island next to Mykonos. Rumor has it that there are around 700 churches on this small parcel of land, nicknamed the Holy Island. Every year on August 15th, thousands of worshippers of the Greek Orthodox religion travel to a church there. Widely considered the holiest church in Greece, it houses the so-called miraculous icon of the Virgin Mary. August 15th is a national holiday in the country, marking the day when the Virgin Mary is said to have ascended to heaven. Many of the people who make the pilgrimage to the church are hoping for a miracle, which they believe can be achieved by visiting the site. While this annual journey has been going on for centuries, the miraculous icon of the Virgin Mary was reportedly discovered in 1823, after a nun who lived on the island had visions that led her to it. She claimed that the Virgin Mary visited her and told her where to find the icon. At the time, Greece was under Ottoman rule. The nun's visions gave people hope, and some of the holy icon's first visitors were revolutionaries fighting for Greek independence. Even today, pilgrims demonstrate an enormous amount of devotion to the Virgin Mary. Many crawl on their hands and knees in the sweltering heat from their boats to the site. Some people even sleep outside the church on the night before the holiday to ensure that they won't miss out on the opportunity to see the icon firsthand. On the day of the event, the icon is paraded through the streets by Greek soldiers, priests, and politicians while worshippers frantically try to touch it in hopes of gaining some spiritual blessings. Trabouk Caves The Trabouk Caves are a network of underground passages in southern France. They contain an unexplained geological formation of short, spiked concretions, or naturally occurring compact masses of natural cement, nicknamed the 100,000 Soldiers. Geologists don't know how the formations were made, and nothing like it has been seen anywhere else on Earth. The spikes are concentrated on a floor in one of the cave system's rooms. They are just a few centimeters tall and there are no traces of stalactites up above or of water dripping from the ceiling, which rules out any standard explanation that scientists can think of. Any traces of water running beneath the cave floor are also absent. These tiny formations are made up of 95% calcite and 5% clay. 
Researchers have entertained every hypothesis they can think of, including the possibility that bacteria or electrostatic forces might play a role. But there is nothing different about this section of the cave than anywhere else within the network, making it hard to attribute the 100,000 soldiers to any specific cause. When even the experts are baffled about how something came to be, it's hard not to wonder if supernatural forces are somehow at play. Temple of Santa Muerte An estimated 10 to 12 million people throughout the world worship Santa Muerte, or the Saint of the Dead. The belief in this seemingly morbid deity arose in Mexico, where people see her as a reincarnation of the Aztec death goddess Mixteca Cihuatl. The Vatican disapproves of Santa Muerte, and many mistakenly believe that she represents some form of Satanism. Others claim that Santa Muerte worshippers are part of a cult that attracts drug traffickers and other deviants. But her followers argue that this is a misunderstanding. They see Santa Muerte as a non-judgmental personification of death, someone who grants wishes in exchange for pledges and offerings, and who comes and takes people's souls when their time on Earth is over. These beliefs can be traced back to pre-Columbian culture, which unlike most modern religions, didn't shy away from death. However, due to widespread disapproval, people worshipped Santa Muerte mostly in secret until the beginning of the 21st century. One of the first openly dedicated temples to her is the Temple of Santa Muerte International. It was opened during the early 2000s outside Mexico City and has continued to grow ever since, often attracting devotees from society's most marginalized sectors. The oddly festive temple is decorated with an unusual combination of bright colors, skulls, and cloaked skeletons, to whom visitors offer cigarettes and other offerings. It is here that visitors come to ask Santa Muerte for blessings and help with their struggles. They believe that she can hear their prayers and that she has the power to help them improve their lives. And contrary to popular misconception, people generally do not ask Santa Muerte for anything bad but for the same things someone might ask any other saint or spiritual entity, like good health and prosperity. Do you think ancient gods of death or deities associated with death had only negative purposes? Let me know in the comments below. Te Waikoro Pupu Springs Some of the clearest fresh water in the world can be found at Te Waikoro Pupu Springs in Takaka, New Zealand. I'm sure I messed up that pronunciation. Located in Golden Bay on the South Island, the springs have a measured visibility of 207 feet, making them almost as clear as water can possibly get. There are eight main vents which discharge 40 bathtubs worth of water every second. Visitors are banned from touching these pristine waters in any way, which includes wading, swimming, boating, fishing, and even filling water bottles. Only a handful of divers have ever gotten permission to enter the springs. The springs are a registered Maori Wahi Tapu, or sacred site. According to Maori legend, Waikoro Pupu is the home of a female supernatural being, or Taniwa, named Huriawa. Known for her bravery and wisdom, Huriawa is both a land and water-dwelling entity who dives deep into the earth to clear blocked waterways. The Maori, who first visited the site around 700 years ago, believe that Huriwawa lives at the springs when she's not handling matters elsewhere. Osun Osogbo Sacred Grove The Yoruba people of West Africa worship a fertility goddess called Osun. There is only one remaining site dedicated to her, and it's located in Nigeria on the outskirts of the city of Osogbo. Known as the Osun Osogbo Sacred Grove, it's situated along the Osun River, where the Yoruba people believe that Osun still lives. According to legend, an elephant hunter discovered the grove during an expedition. Osun agreed to protect the Yoruba if they built a shrine dedicated to her. They complied, and the grove became a site where women who struggled to have children came seeking Osun's blessings. There are around 40 shrines throughout the grove, with some dating as far back as 400 years. There are also two palaces, five sacred places, and nine designated worship points people still come here to pay their respects to Osun and other gods and goddesses. The grove was narrowly spared from demolition in recent years, thanks to the ongoing efforts of modern sculptors, who have erected their own artwork as a way of reinforcing the connection between the Yoruba people and the site. In addition to being a sacred place of worship, the Osun Osogbo Grove is a natural pharmacy with over 200 medicinal plant species. Cenote Ik Kiel one of the most enchanting sites in all of Mexico can be found on the northern end of the Yucatan Peninsula, just down the road from the famous pyramids of Chichen Itza. 
Known as Ik Kiel, this 130-foot deep cenote or sinkhole looks like something straight out of a fairy tale, with turquoise water, mini waterfalls, and hanging vines. Its history is arguably a little less beautiful. The ancient Maya people considered Ik Kiel to be a sacred site, and they used it as a location for sacrificing humans to their rain god, Chalk. Archaeologists have reportedly found jewelry, bones, and other evidence of this in the sinkhole. The Mayans believed that cenotes like Ik Kiel held healing properties, and when they weren't throwing in human sacrifices, they also claimed fresh water from them. The Mayans also believed cenotes were portals to the underworld or communication devices with the gods. When you experience the sheer splendor of this fantasy-like swimming hole, it's easy to understand why the Mayans attach spiritual significance to it. Even with the darker history of Maya human sacrifice, it's clearly a special spot. The Unfinished Obelisk The unfinished obelisk of Aswan in Egypt is one of the most striking monuments ever. It is a giant obelisk carved from stone that some say is proof of the infinite knowledge and unparalleled engineering skill of the ancient Egyptians. It is the largest obelisk that has ever been built, which is pretty amazing considering it came from roughly 3,500 years ago, during the New Kingdom's 18th dynasty. This was a time when Queen Hatshepsut had complete rule over Egypt. She was the wife of the king, Tutmos II, who was also her half-brother, but it was she who ordered the obelisk to be built. She also commissioned many other engineering projects and later became a pharaoh in her own right. The obelisk was supposed to be placed in the temple at Karnak, but the builders had bitten off a little bit more than they could chew. The obelisk is in the exact same spot it was in at the time of its construction, still lying in the ground. The issue was its size. The obelisk was over 120 feet long, weighing roughly 1,200 tons. The project was abandoned when the workers found cracks in its foundation, which meant even if they could lift the huge thing out of the ground, it would have shattered to pieces. This incredible monument has taught us a lot about ancient Egyptian engineering and how they were able to carve out obelisks during ancient times. But questions still remain as to how were the Egyptians planning on getting something so big out of the quarry and all the way to the temple of Karnak? Nobody knows the answer to that question. Archaeologists have found small cavities drilled into the rock. The cavities would have been filled with wood chips, which when soaked would have expanded and detached the obelisk from its base. But how they were going to carry it dozens of miles is anyone's guess. The Inca Waka Complex The Greater Kenko Complex was once a sacred site for the Inca, located in the Cusco region of Peru. This enormous archaeological site consists of several smaller rock-cut complexes, and what was once the ancient Incan city of Quescu. The dating of the caves and monuments here has been sketchy at best, though most scholars agree it was probably built between 1418 and 1472 by the great ruler Pachacuti. This is the leader who transformed the kingdom of Cusco, a rough band of peoples living in Peru, into what we recognize as the great Inca Empire. But what is the complex of Kenco Grande? It's hard to describe as it's unlike most of the ancient temples and settlements built by the Inca. It's known as a waka, which was built along a processional ceremonial route. The site is made up of a huge outcrop carved out of the stone, which overlooks a large platform in the center of a circular plaza. All around the plaza are sacred caves. One cave to the north appears to have been carved out by hand. There are 19 niches beaten into the cave walls, which archaeologists say were seats used by the elite members of society during rituals and ceremonies. Either that, or they were seats for ancestral mummies, which also attended the ceremonies. Researchers still don't know for sure what the site was used for. It definitely had some kind of ceremonial purpose, but that exact purpose is a mystery. The site may have been used for burials, with the Inca depositing the bodies of important people inside the nearby caves. This way, the souls of the dead would have an easier time reaching the underworld, which the Inca believed was located deep inside cave networks. The deeper inside the cave, the easier for the soul to travel. Kailasa Temple The Kailasa Temple in Ellora, India is one of the most spectacular wonders of the ancient world that almost nobody talks about. The temple itself is the largest single monolithic structure anywhere on the planet, according to the Times of India. This thing is enormous. 
and it's actually just one of 32 mysterious cave temples and monasteries that form the larger archaeological site of the Ellora Caves. Some caves and temples are already lost underwater and might be as old as the last ice age. Historical records tell us it was constructed in the 8th century by King Krishna I, sometime around the year 756 AD. The legend goes that it took only one week to build, as a queen whose husband was very sick prayed to Lord Shiva to cure her husband, and in return she would not eat until she could build a temple to honor him. Her prayers were answered, and the queen summoned an architect who worked as quickly as possible, afraid that the queen might starve to death. The large temple was designed to mimic Mount Kailasa, the mythical home of Shiva. But what's unique about the temple is that it stands alone as an enormous complex with no other adjoining structures. It's a big temple carved right out of the side of a mountain. Somewhere around 2 million tons of rock had to be moved to give the temple its shape. Archaeologists guess it would have taken somewhere around 100 years to complete. Though this is quite strange because history says it only took 18 years to build. Our modern engineers don't know how they did it so fast. It's one of those weird archaeological mysteries that scientists have never been able to solve. Another story goes that the Mughal ruler Aurangzeb tried to destroy the beautiful Kailasa temple, making 1,000 men try to take it down piece by piece. Although he tried and tried, all he managed to accomplish was some superficial damage. Nobody knows who built the temple, but this magnificent work of art has managed to somewhat survive the test of time as a tribute to the gods. Colossal Stone Heads The Olmec civilization lived along the Gulf Coast of Mexico from about 1200 BC to 400 BC, way before the Aztec or the Inca. And yet despite what they've left behind in their ruined cities, historians know almost nothing about them. They are considered to be the most mysterious major civilization of the ancient world. Nobody even knows where they came from or where they went when they suddenly disappeared. The most famous archaeological site having to do with the Olmec is San Lorenzo. This was once a major city for the Olmec, and archaeologists have found 10 giant stone heads here that are beyond explanation. The giant heads are really huge, with some of them up to 14.7 feet in circumference and over 9 feet tall. Each head weighs roughly 8 tons and was sculpted out of a pure basalt boulder and colorfully painted. But where are the bodies that go with the heads? And why were the heads so big? Who are these heads supposed to represent? Archaeologists don't have the answers. They have guessed that the only reason they carved just heads was because they believed that it was only the head which contained the soul of an individual. It's most likely that the heads were supposed to commemorate Olmec rulers, but most of their story has been lost. Mystery Hill Mystery Hill is often referred to as America's Stonehenge. Some believe it to be the oldest archaeological site in the United States, but that is kind of up for debate. The site itself is claimed to be 4,000 years old and is an alleged megalithic astronomical complex built by an unknown Native American culture. Others believe it to be a lost monastery built by a group of Irish monks. The truth is that nobody knows the origins of Mystery Hill, hence its straightforward name. Mystery Hill in New Hampshire is actually nothing like Stonehenge, despite the connections some think it has. It's really just an arrangement of underground rock chambers with rock structures built on top. There are also grooves surrounding the site which experts believe could be drainage ditches. The site was pretty much ignored by locals up until 1937. It was then that antiquarian enthusiast William Goodwin took interest in the site and did his own investigations, coming to the conclusion that Irish monks had been fleeing the Vikings and somehow managed to land in New Hampshire way before Columbus ever arrived in America. Suddenly, everyone took an interest and the site could rewrite history forever. This theory was never proven and in 1956, the site was purchased by the Stone family and they changed its name to the American Stonehenge and opened a gift shop. Since then, it's believed that the Viking site that Goodwin was hoping for was probably the Viking settlement that was found in Newfoundland, Canada. He wasn't that far off. And since then, historians and archaeologists remain intrigued by the site, but no one has been able to explain it. Stone Labyrinths Speaking of unexplained sites, nobody has any idea why a mysterious group of people built ancient labyrinths on a small island in the north of Russia. Bolshoi Zayatsky Island looks like something you might see in a fantasy movie. 
All across its surface are mysterious labyrinths built from stone, with some of them being dated back to 30,000 BC. These are easily the oldest monuments I've told you about, and yet despite their age, many look as though they were just finished yesterday. Archaeologists don't know what the labyrinths were built for, who built them, or why they chose such a remote island in the middle of nowhere. Many experts agree that they were probably for some kind of mystical use, perhaps to trap evil spirits, to perform ritual ceremonies, or to create a portal to the underworld. It's doubtful that they actually managed to create an ethereal portal to another realm, but scientists seem to agree this island was once a place of magic. Puma Punku Puma Punku is one of the largest temple complexes in Bolivia, part of a grander archaeological site called Tiahuanacu. The temple has a very mysterious origin. Nobody is really sure why it was made, though based on recent carbon dating of organic material found around the temple, it has been dated to being built somewhere between 300 and 1000 AD. This means it predates the Inca Empire. It was probably created by the Tiwanaku Empire, who flourished just before the Inca. By the time the Inca stumbled upon Puma Punku, the Tiwanaku were already gone. But more intriguing than the disappearance of the people who lived here is the stonework they left behind. Over a thousand years ago, Puma Punku was a massive complex of stone pieced together by megalithic blocks, with each block weighing tens of tons. The stones were cut from red sandstone in such a precise way that some of them are still snug so tightly together that you can't fit a razor blade or a piece of paper between the cracks. In fact, they have gotten the world's attention for being so perfect that some believe this culture must have had access to mysterious ancient technology. The precision is just like that from a machine with even the holes drilled smoothly to perfection, as if by modern instruments. Researchers have even found evidence of metal clamps that had been used to bind the stones together. The big mystery here is the fact that the Tiwanaku built such amazing monuments when they didn't even have access to the wheel. They also had no writing system that we know of. By ancient standards, these people were considered primal, and yet they were able to build temples with stones that fit together like perfect puzzle pieces. Clava Cairns the Clava Cairns is the name for an extremely well-preserved cemetery from the Bronze Age, located in the Scottish Highlands. The cemetery is filled with strange ring cairns, bizarre standing stones, and passage graves. It can be found near Inverness, just a few miles away from Loch Ness. According to Scottish tourism, it is one of the best examples of the very ancient history of Highland Scotland, with the oldest burial dating back to 4,000 years ago. This creepy cemetery was actually used in two separate periods. In the year 2000 BC, a mysterious group of people constructed a row of burial cairns. Which, by the way, if you don't know, burial cairns are basically just rock graves in which a person is buried underground and then a large heap of stones is piled over them, referred to as a cairn. Then, 1,000 years after the first burials were made, new people came along and reused the site putting new burials in some of the existing cairns, and then adding their very own monuments. There is even a smaller cemetery just a few miles west that's just as mysterious. But the history of the site goes back way before anyone was buried here. Archaeologists have found evidence of farming before any of the monuments were placed, suggesting this may have been a burial ground for a very important group of locals, though scientists honestly can't say who they were. The Ancient City of Knossos the island of Crete in modern Greece was once home to an ancient group of people that still amazes everyone. This was the base for the Minoans, and their legendary king was King Minos, but we don't know what they actually called themselves. They left behind the ancient city of Knossos, and the very first centralized state anywhere in Europe way before classical Greece. In fact, the Minoans reached their peak at least 1,000 years before Greece was even a thing and they were immortalized in the myths of Theseus and the Minotaur, and Icarus who flew too close to the sun. Based on their art and jewelry, it appears the Minoans believed in a supreme female deity, and believed in equality between the sexes, which was practically unheard of in the ancient world. One of the most famous artifacts found in the ruins of the city of Knossos was a ring. It was discovered in a tomb buried for 3,500 years. German archaeologist Gerhard Rodenwald said it was reminiscent of an enchantment from a fairy world. It was probably worn on a necklace to signify high status while doubling as a talisman to deflect evil. 
Someone would have had to have used a magnifying glass to carve these intricate figures in minute detail. On the ring, there is an inscription written in a bizarre language that all these years later, scholars and scientists still can't decipher. Easter Island Glyphs Easter Island is famous for its giant statues, the Moai. But back in the 19th century, explorers discovered a small trove of ancient artifacts etched with bizarre symbols, kind of like the ring I just told you about from ancient Crete, hidden in the ruins of the collapsed civilization. The artifacts are scrawled in glyphs that have never been deciphered. The glyphs are called Rongo Rongo, and this type of writing was first found by Eugene Urod with the Roman Catholic Church, who went to the island as a missionary in 1864. In his journal, he detailed finding 26 wooden tablets covered in the glyphs, with some of the characters looking like crudely drawn turtles and others looking like pieces of Sanskrit. He collected these tablets from the huts the natives were living in who had obviously lost the meaning of the glyphs and didn't understand what they were for. They'd been keeping them like sacred treasure, but couldn't tell Eugene when they were first made, though some experts have guessed it was in the 13th century. Even though Rongo Rongo has been known to scientists for over 100 years, they still haven't figured out what the writing means. And this is a real shame, because whatever is written on these tablets could explain the mysterious collapse of the original island civilization, who some say died out when they used all their resources and could no longer sustain their population. Thanks for watching! What do you think about these incredible places? Do you have any theories about the Easter Island glyphs? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button and come back soon for another amazing video. Bye!